Um, as I have expressed before, one, I want to acknowledge my colleagues who were able to be here today with me. Uh, to my left is uh, Senator David Bates, who represents the communities of Barrington and Bristol, portion of Bristol. Uh, to my far right is Senator Hal Metz, who is from the city of Providence. To my immediate right is Senator Louis De Palma. He represents Middletown, Little Compton, Tiverton, and a little bit of Newport. Um, and a portion of Tiverton and all of Middletown, I believe. Okay. Uh, as I expressed before, we have been trying to do this on a fairly rapid basis. Therefore, some of my colleagues have been unable to attend having other scheduled meetings at the same time as this. Um, our intention was to try to get the information to us and forward as quickly as possible. Uh, therefore, we have uh, put, if you will, a fast track on uh, this commission gathering. All of my colleagues have access to DVDs of the testimony presented uh, and will be reviewing it prior to any uh, final determination, report, etc., by this commission. I would like to very quickly give everyone an a, uh, idea of the future um, meetings of the Senate LNG Task Force. The next meeting is scheduled is March 2nd. It will be at 2 o'clock. We anticipate it will be here in the Senate Lounge. That will be an opportunity for our city and town testimony, uh, the leaders, the uh, community leaders and public safety folks from our cities and towns. On March 9th, we have extended and they have agreed uh, to have the principals of the matter, Weavers Cove, uh, come in and participate in the discussion here, uh, present testimony as to uh, their uh, intentions. Uh, we have tentatively scheduled March 11th, uh, 2 o'clock, a room to be announced in all likelihood here again in the Senate chamber uh, to hear testimony from the United States Coast Guard, Rhode Island Pilots, and the Rhode Island Bridge and Turnpike Authority. And finally, on March 16th, approximately 2 o'clock again, a room to be announced, but I anticipate it will be here, uh, to hear from the Preservation Society of Newport, the Kickamoo River Council, a Jamestown LNG work group that has expressed an interest in coming forward, and public testimony will be welcome at that time. Okay. Uh, I would want to note that in everybody's packet, and we have available if other folks would like to see it, uh, there was an email sent to us by Tim Byrne uh, about this issue. It will be included in the uh, documentation of the commission. And at this point, I would like to uh, call, I'm hoping that everyone is here. Uh, we have identified uh, some of the folks by particular groups or organizations that they represent. Um, at this time, I would like to call forward Mr. Byrne from the Rhode Island Building Trades uh, in order to provide some insight from his organization. Mr. Byrne, if you would stand uh, there. I know there are several recording devices up there, so. So I won't be missed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Tim Byrne. I, uh, I apologize for a prepared uh, document, but it seems to be easy to keep your thoughts straight that way. My name is Tim Byrne. I'm a business agent for the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters. We represent more than 1,300 plumbers and pipefitters in the areas of Rhode Island and southeastern Massachusetts, which includes the islands of Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and Block Island. I currently live at 140 Evans Ave in Tiverton, and I'm approximately one mile within sight of the new proposed unloading facility. I've been a pipe fitter for 29 years, performing the duties of a business agent, a foreman, a certified pipe welder, in gas-fired power plants, coal-fired, oil-fired, nuclear, and also in liquefied natural gas facilities. I would like to redirect the focus of this hearing from the discussion concerning the challenges and the fears of transporting liquefied natural gas through the waterways of Narragansett and Mount Hope Bays to the availability of work for a project that this produces, as well as the standards of safety that those constructing it are held to. The construction of the Weavers Cove facility and a proposed transmission pipeline mean a great deal of work opportunity to the members that I represent, as well as the many members who belong to the other 13 building trades that would be involved in the construction of this facility. 
The initial construction of this facility is scheduled to utilize 2.5 million man hours, which can translate into 400 workers for a total of 36 months, which is the construction timeline as presented by Weavers Cove in their request to initiate the pre-filing process to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission dated April 18, 2008. In the time when my organization is experiencing more than 45 percent unemployment, a project of this magnitude certainly dictates a closer look. I understand that this facility is located in a neighboring Massachusetts, and I feel one of the reasons that this commission was enlisted was to investigate the transportation of this product through Rhode Island waterways, as also the close proximity of Rhode Island to the newly proposed unloading platform. However, I can only sit here before you and testify to the safest, most highly qualified workers for the construction of this facility, should it be built. We spend more than $1.5 million annually training our members in the latest, most up-to-date construction and piping codes that are available. Weavers Cove has pr proposed a pipe within a pipe design for the 4.5 mile transmission line to move the liquefied natural gas product from the unloading platform to the storage and a process facility. This, pro this product, in order to maintain its liquefied state, must remain at approximately minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit from the unloading platform to the facility. This concept will require a cryogenic insulation system manufactured by Aerogel Manufacturing, an East Providence company, who produces high density cryogenic insulators. The initial transfer pipe is manufactured from a base metal alloy called Invar M93. This material was first discovered in 1896 and has since become the standard material used for applications that require a low coefficient of thermal expansion such as medical instruments and most notably our NASA space program. The outer layer or the cover layer is manufactured from a stainless steel alloy known as 317L. This stainless steel alloy provides a greater corrosion and chemical resistance than a more commonly utilized compound such as 304 and 308 stainless steel. The qualified welding procedures for this pipe can include MIG, which is a mechanical inert gas welding, TIG, tungsten inert gas, welding or any type of automatic welding such as computer-aided diametric or orbital ma machine procedures which utilize either of these two processes. The National Fire Protection Association publishes guidelines for the safe production, storage and handling of liquefied natural gas. This section is referred to as NFPA 59A. NFPA 59A which regards, with regards to the handling, the installation and connections of the equipment and material refers to an ASB 9 code numbered B313. All of the welding procedures and the installation procedures are controlled by ASB 9 B313. This code is promulgated and administered by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and is typically utilized in petroleum refineries, chemical, pharmaceutical, textile, paper, semiconductor, and cryogenic plants, as well as any related processing plants and terminals. Now, I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to sit here before this commission and cite chapter and verse from B313. But I would like to provide a sample of the testing procedures that are required for the inspection of all welding procedures that would be used in conjunction with the construction of Weaver's Cove. Under section 341.3.4 of the pressure code B313, the use of progressive sampling for the examination of welded joints is outlined. Paragraph C of this section states that if any of the items inspected reveals a defect, then two further samples of the same kind of weld performed by the same welder will be examined. In any additional defects that are discovered, they would be either repaired, cut out, or both. Section 341.5.1, entitled Spot Radiography, requires that not less than one x-ray out of every 20 welds from each welder is tested. This would translate into about 5% of the total number of welds on a project that would be x-rayed. The radiological section of the construction specifications for the Weavers Cove project would require that 100% of all welded connections will be x-rayed for 0% inclusion of all foreign matter. This is clearly in excess of the requirements of B313 and NFPA 59A. Now, I realize that many of this can sound pretty foreign and even technical in nature, but the point that I'm trying to stress is that the criteria that we train our members to and the specifications of this project are designed to produce the safest, most highly trained worker for the installation of pipe on a project such as this. These standards and these procedures are not new to us, nor are they new to the state of Rhode Island. 